So welcome everyone to the Easter Ross Committee. I shall just read out the, the meeting protocol um, that's required to be noted at the beginning. So please note that this meeting will be filmed for the webcast and subsequent archiving for public access via the Council's internet site. If any member loses connection or has any technical issues during the meeting, support will be available from Ian Street, our ICT officer, on the phone number which has been emailed to you. Please can members ensure that they've activated their cameras and muted their microphones. <coughs> it's essential that you use both throughout the meeting. However, in the event that use of your camera affects your connectivity, you can turn off the camera after confirming your attendance at the start of the meeting and only use it when you wish to contribute to the debate, move or second a motion or event, amendment or vote. You'll also need to remember to unmute your microphone when you want to speak and turn it back to mute thereafter. If a member wishes to ask a question or enter the discussion on an item, please activate the electronic hand, which is on the task bar towards the bottom of your screen. Your requests are being monitored and at the appropriate time, I'll invite you to speak. The electronic hand procedure also applies to declarations of interest and I'll be asking for those in a few minutes. In relation to your declarations of interest, you need to ensure that if you've made a declaration, which would normally require you to leave the chamber, such as a financial interest, you should turn your camera off and mute your microphone when we come to that item. You'll still be able to hear the discussion, but not take part in any way. At the end of the item, you can turn your camera back on and return to the meeting as normal. If you've made a non-financial declaration or any other declaration where you would not normally leave the chamber, then you can leave your camera on if you wish and take part or not. If a member wishes to raise a point of order, this should be done by unmuting the microphone to interrupt proceedings and gain the attention of the chair. The conversation line can be activated by clicking once on conversation and you'll see on the task bar at the bottom of your screen. And this will have the effect of displaying the conversation on the right hand margin of your screen. Please note the conversation line should only be used to type in motions and amendments. And finally, if we need to adjourn the meeting for any reason, you'll be required to disconnect from the meeting at the point of adjournment. A time will be given for the meeting to recommence and that you'll then just need to join the meeting again as normal. This will ensure that everyone is aware of the restart time, including those who be, may be watching the webcast. So first, if I can ask Fiona if she could take the roll call, please. Morning, members. Uh, OK, uh, Councillor Finlayson. Here. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Loudon. Present, thanks. Councillor Munro. Present. Councillor Rind. Here. Councillor Robertson. Here. Here. Councillor Smith. Here. And Councillor Wilson. I've got a message from Councillor from Councillor Wilson. Um, she's struggling um, to get in, but she'll join us as soon as she can. OK, thanks, Helen. And I have no other apologies. OK, thank you, Fiona. OK, members, declarations of interest from anyone? No. OK, that's good. Thank you. OK, so the next item on our agenda, item number three, is the community update. Now, I know we had this on the, the previous committee, um, but the reason is to, to get an update since things have moved on um, and looking at the situation as we return um, to a second wave of COVID. Just to make sure that Highland Council are doing everything that we can to support the communities in Cromarty Firth and Tain and Easter Ross. And I'm delighted that we've got Polly Monroe, who's going to speak on behalf of the community in Cromarty Firth. And we have Dave McRae from the Tain and District Development Trust, who's going to give us an update um, on what the Trust have been doing and preparing um, for the time that we've got ahead. So I'd like to ask Pauline if she could speak first. Yeah, thank you, Fiona. Polly, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Fiona. Well, I'll keep it as brief as I can because, I mean, I know that everybody's heard what, what previously had happened before. Yeah. First of all, you know, I mean, who would have thought when I first seen a, a, a wee thing on Facebook, Tina McCaffrey saying, everybody, please come and help, that it would have ended up this far down the line. But I mean, to be fair to her, she started it off and got the ball rolling. And then 
to end it all, our other local member got a lovely award. She got the Regional Champion Award for the Highlands. So, I mean, you know, we can't say much better than that. The Highlands have done really well. It was a great, and Carolyn will say this herself, it was a great team effort. Everybody, I mean, every councillor in our ward was fantastic. We, we were very lucky, shall we say. But moving forward, yes, we have got kind of everything covered. We've, uh, well, we hope, never say everything. I shouldn't say that, but we hope we've everything covered. We've kept our food banks in place and we've had reassurance from all the local supermarkets um, that they're willing to keep helping us through Christmas and whatever, uh, for however long, actually. Uh, now they're giving us food, still giving us food twice a week instead of one big drop. So that's been great. Uh, the food banks are absolutely bursting at the door. I mean, they really are. They're really busy. So we can see that there's they're still a need. And there's definitely still a need because it isn't people you would normally think that are coming to a food bank, which actually is really good. A lot of it is young parents who have either got a second mortgage or things. So that's good. I'm glad that they're reaching out now because that was a bit of a struggle at first. We've also kept a little pot of money that, that we that we managed to raise to help with the electricity and things, which we're doing ongoing. So just to keep them topped up so they don't get into any more debt is, is, is our plan. Um, all of the local groups have been fantastic. We have an open phone line 24 hours a day if there's anybody worried about anything. I mean, on all of that, we're just going to keep running. It does. It is quite a lot of work to keep it up. But, you know, for another few months, we'll, and then we'll see where we're going. We're very lucky we live in the Highlands. I have to say, I did say a wee prayer to thank whoever for not giving us another great big second lockdown, I have to say, because that would have meant us doubling all the efforts once again. And that means a lot more people involved, which again, spreads potentially could spread more germs. So I'm, I'm actually really pleased with the regional, the way it's happening. But moving forward yet, yeah, we're in a very, very clear plan we're very organized this time around we're not going to be caught off the hoof again everybody's willing to pick up the tools again if we ever have to go down a second you know lockdown so yeah going forward we're in a really safe I, I can only say for just now feel like we're in a really safe place at the moment everybody's looking after their own little patch and we're all working together to make sure that everybody in each members patch is getting what they need. The council have been fantastic with me. Any problems I have, any help I need, absolutely, they, they really have. They've stepped up and helped us. So I would like to say thank you to everyone, you know, for helping us along our journey. And yeah, just let's hope we keep it going as long as we can and as long as we need to be. So I think that's me, Fiona. There's not really much else to say. You've heard all the other stuff before, you know? So I think that's about where we're going just now. So, and to hi, sorry. Hi have, been, hi have helped us a lot recently because we had to do all our receipts and, you know, just to make sure the money and everything was right. And we've done all of that. And they were so helpful. They could sort of walked us through it. And oh, we've just been very, very lucky. So let's hope it continues. Thank you. That's great, Pauline. Thank you. That's really helpful to know that. Is there anything that Highland Council could be doing that we could bring from the area committee back to Highland Council? Any support? Well, do you know what, Fiona, do you know what one of the, 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 the biggest surprise support was is that when we had finished feeding everyone and we had reduced our numbers down to just the very, very vulnerable who we are still feeding, now that's only down to about five or six really, really vulnerable people within our village. I think there's a couple in Ember Gordon and a couple in Allness that are really vulnerable. They really need to be fed and that's fine. But what we found was we uh, the council had phoned me up and said, could you use some frozen food? So... We said, oh, yes, you know, that's brilliant. We'll use some of that frozen food. So, unfortunately, my poor husband needed a fit when I turned on four freezers in the in the farm <laughs> to, to keep the frozen food in. But it's now run out. So, if anything, that's what I would ask the council again, because these wee packages were phenomenal. That they, We could get them out fast. Mm -hmm. it mostly, we made sure they all had microwaves. They've all got a wee freezer now. So, yeah, that would be my biggest... For me, personally, I'm sure everybody else might have something else that they'd be looking for. But for me, the frozen food that the council gave us was just came in at the right time. It was fantastic. Great. Well, that's good to know. That's helpful. And we can feed that back into to Highland Council. Thank you, Polly. Moving over to Dave McRae, who works for the Development Trust. Thank you for coming along today, Dave. Um, if you could provide us with an update of the, the trust's work moving forward. We already know um, previously what they've been involved in in the past, but it's looking to the next few months um, work that you have planned and any way that Highland Council can step in and help. 
Yeah, well, thank you for the invite to the, to the meeting today and morning to everyone. Uh, moving forward, we're trying to work with all the local community groups within in the council, within the ward area rather, and I, I've spoken to them to ask what their problems are and where they see their problems going forward. And a lot of them are talking about the lack of volunteers that they now have, volunteer fatigue, and the added expense of operating during COVID. You know, putting in COVID officers uh, where they need to, sanitising and being able to distance and meet. They also talk about uh, the lack of being able to keep in communication. Not everybody is on internet, not everybody has Facebook. And because the Trust covers such a wide area, we cover all of Ward 7. It's a lot to get out there to everybody. Uh, we do have, we have 450 members of the Trust, but we only have 250 email addresses. We have 1,500 people following us on Facebook, but that is relying on people that then have internet access. Uh, locally within TAME, and I know the, the other C the community council areas have been doing similar, been putting out leaflets to the areas. We've been putting out 1,700 leaflets a, once a fortnight, and they're hand-delivered. And that was OK during the summer weather, when it was nice and everybody was eager to get out. And, but with the winter, dark nights, a lot of the people that were doing it were elderly. They're not keen to go out in slippy conditions and that. So that is some of the problems that we're, we're starting to face. The other thing is that we, we kind of see it as it's going to be a different problem, a second wave in that it's going to be more of a mental health issue and a fuel poverty issue this time. People working from home in colder months, having to pay extra bills, extra electricity in the house when they're in during the day. So and, and the the well the mental health of those that are stuck inside in long dark days with no communication. So that, that's where we see the problems for the for the future. How we, how we get round those, we're not too sure. It, 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 because mental health is a health issue, if you like, it's more statutory bodies that will be working with that, the health board and the confidentiality of that. So how we can get people to speak to us or let us know who is needing help, and then who do we coordinate that to? Who do we pass that on to, to get that agencies to work with them? That, that, that is what we see. I've spoken to the Kyla Sutherland Trust and I've spoken to Cromarty, the Cromarty Village Trust as well, and they, they are saying the same thing. So on a wider aspect, all trusts in the area and Invergordon Trust are seeing the, saying the same as well. They're all seeing the same kind of issues. I, I think that's all I can say at the moment. OK, thank you, Dave. That's that's really helpful. Um, and, it, and it is key that you highlight fuel poverty, which is an issue that we have been discussing at Highland Council over and over again um, at the Recovery Board in particular. And um, because we knew that moving into the winter, this was going to be a, a key problem that and the mental health issues with the long, dark nights, with being unable to go out walks um, and to, to pass neighbours and pass the time of day with neighbours. Again, we've seen that as a problem. And you're right, it's down to working with agencies that we're going to be able to address this. And I think it's key that we do make sure communication is in place. Um, we know that very recently there's been some issues down in the seaboard villages. Um, and Norma and Maureen, who spoke at the last area committee, came to their local councillors with the issues um, which we can then take on to the agencies, to the NHS, to Highland Council. Um, but we have to make sure that there's lines of communication in place because sometimes people yeah. just don't know where to turn to. You know, they, they don't know who to go to. Um, and thankfully, you know, they, they can turn to their, their Highland Councillors, but not everyone knows that. So we need to work, I think, a bit harder to make sure that there are key communication channels in place and that people know about it. Yes, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. So I have some questions for you. First of all, Mike Finlayson. 
Yeah, Fiona, I'm glad that the issue regarding communication has, has, uh, has been raised here, and uh, it is very important. Uh, Fiona, you'll remember I raised the issue at the last COVID briefing from Donna uh, regarding, I was scratching my head as to who I should contact, and I couldn't couldn't really get round to the exact person. But Kate Latty was saying afterwards that the, the original um, what did communication, um, I don't know, website or whatever it is, is still open. But <clears throat> I think people need to know that. And uh, it's always good to be able to speak to somebody, but I know costs come into that rather than just a, the, the old email. But um, especially for the folk who are a bit more elderly like myself. But um, there we go. So I think we, sh we should be able to, I think it'd be good if we could raise that issue directly with them again. Uh, it's not It's not happening at Highland Council, it is, but um, it's good to remind them. Thank okay, you. thank you, Mike. Yep, you're absolutely right. I think that, that will be a key message that we need to take um, from this meeting. I've got Pauline now. Yeah, I was just going to say what we did. I mean, it's not foolproof but what we did is we sort of split a lot of our sort of groups up almost and then we have like a I think it's on a Tuesday and a Friday is our busiest days so then we have like a debriefing on a Friday so I've got like we've got like action for children they they go and they run the food banks for us we've got Tina McCarthy and Amber Gordon she runs what she runs through there Maxine unfortunately has to sit then she I mean I'm always on to Maxine who do I ask who do I ask but that's where Maxine fills it all fantastically for me and myself and Caroline we debrief with them all usually on a, on a well a, mostly me because poor Caroline she's working all day uh, so we do a debriefing and any issues that they have, we get them all on a Friday because for me it makes it a lot easier than having to deal with all the issues throughout the whole week. So what I do is all our groups and all our different halls, I say, look, there's a register, there's a book. If there's a big issue, keep it there, write it down, name, address, what's the issue? I mean, I know it sounds, it doesn't sound like it works and it didn't at first because of so many questions, but now people have kind of got used to it. And I found for um, the people locally, they're now going to the hall and saying, oh, can you give this message to Councillor Monroe? Because, you know, for a while there, I was getting like 50 calls a day and I just couldn't fit them all in laterally. So we had to break it up that way to make sure that everybody was having their say. So if anybody had any issues, they knew exactly where to call them. But we used, we did use social media. We didn't use leaflets or anything because I'm rubbish at uh, doing leaflets, I have to be honest. <laughs> Thanks, Pauline. That's that's really helpful to know as well. Um, I think that's where this kind of meeting is good and the sharing of information and, and taking ideas that others have tried. You know, the debrief idea is a really good idea um, and it's something that perhaps we can do in our ward. Uh, thanks, Fiona. Um, thanks, for, uh, thanks for the... Uh, the detail there, uh, Dave. Oops. Um, you know, I, I really enjoyed um, working working with uh, the Development Trust um, in the early stages um, to um, to get that uh, show on the road. And you did a fantastic job, uh, really, really good. And you know, mu much appreciated by by everybody in the area. Yeah, I, I know that. Um, uh, just on the on the one point you were raising about um, communications and how do you keep in touch with people, I know that Homestart East Highland um, had a, a number of um, devices. Um, I think they had um, some uh, sort of uh, Chromebooks type uh, devices and also phones um, that they were uh, they were managing to. Um, to distribute to, um, I think, a, largely around um, a Milton um, with Action for Children. So that's maybe, um, I'll get you the, the contact details uh, yeah. for that. And, you know, it might might be, a, um, you know, an opportunity to, to, um, to give uh, one or two phones out to families that are, um, that are struggling to keep in touch, um, if that would help. Yep. Uh, sorry if I, was, if I can get back yeah. on that one. Yeah, we, of course. Have, we had uh, connections with the Connect Scotland and they okay. had phone books in that as well. But I found the difficulty there was we had to identify families that were 
in need and the agencies weren't willing to give us the information of who was in need? I I think um, I think Home Start um, have a bit more flexibility there, so right. they should be able to help. Okay, thanks. Okay, Maxine. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, can I say Home Start were really useful and helpful, um, especially in Invergordon, um, part of our ward as well, uh, during COVID. Um, yeah, I didn't come in to speak on that, but um, I'll just carry on. Um, yeah, can I say that because of the communication being on Facebook, and people have got used to that now, and so they know who to go to, they go to Pauline, they know that Pauline leads on it, so they just go to her page, go to one of the COVID pages. We've got two COVID groups, one led by Tina um, and the other in Allness. And, and people know where to go, so it's working fine now. I, I wouldn't worry that anybody in our ward has fallen through the cracks. In fact, to be honest, um, I know Pauline's um, noticed other issues with some of our elderly, which would not have been picked up had she not been delivering the meals. So it's actually worked out really well. Anyway, I put my hand up just to say, just to add another thing uh, to the minute and make it public in case not everybody is aware. Uh, you know that we have quite a lot of Albin properties um, in our Easter Ross area and Albin still have um, some money left in their welfare fund. Um, I'm not sure they call it the welfare fund, but right at the start, the first week of COVID, um, they set aside £200,000 um, for anybody that was struggling with bills or food or anything else. And obviously you have to be an Albin tenant, but can I just flag that up? So if anybody does need to apply, if they just get in touch with Albin, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Maxine. That's handy to know. Is there anyone in particular that they should speak to? Um, because they're all working from home, if they just like um, email the ordinary number, um, then you know, or if they stop, just email me and we'll put them onto them or phone. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Thank you. That's really good information to have, and um, that we should share. I think after this meeting with all the different groups that we have in our email list. Thank you. I don't have any more hands to speak. Um, Dave, is there anything else you would like to come back on? No, I'm, I'm fine, but just thanks very much for the information that you've passed on. You've all passed on. That's great. Great. Well, thank you. And thank you for the work of the trust that each and every one does. Um, and all the groups, all the groups that we have working in both our wards are phenomenal. Um, the, the food banks have just been amazing. The community councils, the, the trust even lots of new little groups that have just sprung up, very um, informal little collections of groups um, who just get on with the work, who just get on with feeding people, helping people, shopping for them, um, or just looking in on them. Um, it, it's unbelievable. It's, it's just amazing um, how our communities have really stepped up to the mark. And I'm sure we'll do it again, um, but we need to make sure that Highland Council and the other agencies are fully behind them and do everything that we can um, to support and encourage the groups. So thank you, Dave. Um, you're very welcome to stay if you want or... <laughs> no, <laughs> you, if you don't mind, I'll stay for a while. All right. OK, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. OK, members, moving on to item number four on the report, which is the Area Performance Summary Report on Fire. And we have Alex McKinley here, who's the Group Commander for Highland North. Um, to talk to the report. Members are invited to comment on and scrutinise the attached area performance report in your papers. Good morning, Hi, Fiona. Hi. Hi. Morning. Hey, thanks for inviting me along today. Um, I presented the report and the executive summary. Uh, I'm encouraged that uh, uh, there's nothing significant uh, that's popping out that worries me. Uh, all levels and all aspects are remaining low, which is a a great indication of the commitment of our fire crews uh, working in an intervention role as well as a preventative role and also working with our partners within the community and uh, other agencies. So having said that, I, I would just like to open it up without going through in, in detail because you've all received the report and uh, answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Alec. Yep, it is a very detailed report and it's very heartening to read. As you say, that there's um, it, it's good news. Mm, it's good absolutely. news and, and there, there's nothing um, really to worry about or concerning in the report. So thank you for that. Um, Pauline? 
Yeah, I was just going to say it was actually a really nice one. Yeah, <laughs> well written, yeah. thank you very much. I was quite pleased to, to see as few, and I thought, oh, wow, this is a really good one. But also, I'd like to just say, I know that I've used the fire service quite a few times during COVID between having to break into old people's houses and everything. They've been phenomenal. They've been straight there. I mean, look, the, the first service there. So I, I just want you to go back and say to them that, you know, as a, as a ward, we, we just want to thank you because they've all been phenomenal. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Pauline. That's uh, really welcome. Uh, I think we should also highlight the, the employers because it's a uh, a retained part-time firefighters working in the area. I think we must highlight the commitment from the employers allowing their staff to to go. And I'm sorry, there's a phone ringing in the background. I don't know if you can hear it, but apologies for that. Yes, Alex, I'm glad you did highlight um, the commitment that employers in our area do give for our retained firefighters um, because they make such a difference. They do such a, a power of work in our community um, with additional things, as Pauline has pointed out, helping in circumstances where we, we don't quite know where to turn to um, and we need help. And we often do in our ward as well, turn to the fire service and they always turn up and they're always really helpful and very community um, aware and community involved. So it would be good if you did take that back on behalf of the, the whole committee. Um, I certainly will. Uh, when, when I'm doing the station visits, I'll certainly hand on. Thank you. Uh, we we love their, you. their dedication and their commitment to their communities. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank Is there you. any more questions I can help with? There's no more hands up. Is that one from Maxine? No. No, no. Sorry, it's a reflection nope. on a mirror. I should have put my glasses yeah, I've on. Seen, I've seen that too. <laughs> it's a yellow reflection. <laughs> OK, well, well, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate the invite. And, if there is any questions, you've got my contact details. You can contact me anytime. Thank you. I think that might have been one of the quickest reports we've got through. Oh, well, I'm glad it was detailed enough for you. Thank it, you. it certainly was. Thank you, Alec. OK, thank you. Bye now. Thanks, thank Alec. Bye. OK, members, moving on to item number five, which is the Inamori Firth Local Development Plan 2, the main issues report. Um, the report's been circulated, um, a long lengthy report on pages 13 to 134 of your papers, and the committee is invited to approve the main issues report to be published for public consultation, accepting that a number of minor presentational and typographical changes will be made prior to publication. To agree the approach to consultation outlined in paragraph 6.1 of this report, and note the important role that the plan will play in addressing the climate and ecological emergency, economic recovery, and in taking forward the Council's agreed indicative regional spatial strategy recently submitted to the Scottish Government. And with us today, we've got Tim Stott, the principal planner, along with Douglas Chisholm and Julianne Bain, um, and they're going to talk to the report and then at the end answer questions. I'll hand over to you, Tim, is it first? Yes, please. And that's great. Thanks, Chair. Um, yes, I, I, uh, I'll go through the, the front end, end of the plan, which is, um, yeah, uh, you know, as you said, the, the papers begin on page 13. Uh, there's an awful lot on the um, initial issues of the plan, first of all, and then the detail for your ward is at the back. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go through the front end of the plan and then I'll hand over to Douglas and Julianne. Um, uh, Douglas is going to lead lead on in on Invergordon and the de the detail of Invergordon and uh, Julianne will cover Evanton, Olness, Tain and Seaboard uh, villages as well. So um, briefly, a uh, the we are this is sorry this is the third of five area c c c committees that have been asked to endorse the initial consultation draft of of the plan, uh, which is called the main issues uh, report. Uh, next year, we will consult on it. Um, though all those comments will be um, sought and uh, will um, will be um, gone through by officers and we'll be reporting back to the area c committees next year, seeking your views on how the plan or how the, the formal plan, which is issued at the end of next year, uh, what uh, choice of sites and choice of uh, policy options we should make at that time. 
thereafter, um, uh, early 2022, we, we issued the plan again. This is the formal settled view uh, that we have at that point, and formal objections can be lodged at that point. Thereafter, an independent government appointed uh, reporter gets involved and they have the final say on what the plan says. Uh, this uh, jigsaw um, is, is really to uh, show the various components of the main issues uh, rep, rep report. Um, the main issues that, that are in the document have come out of evidence that we've um, had a look at since the plan was last adopted in 2015. Um, there's a vision. There are outcomes in there. There's the nine main issues, which I'll go on to in a wee bit of detail. And those main issues are, have influenced the, the site uh, recommendations that we've made, uh, which are shown on, on the maps. I won't go into an awful lot of detail on this, but the, uh, the HQ uh, Economy, Economy and, Inf and Infrastructure Committee agreed on a, a settled vision for Highland back in the summer. A lot of you took part in the workshops on that, and that was signed off and sent to go government earlier on this year. Uh, obviously, that's for the whole of Highlands. We've tailored those um, that overall vision for Highland to the NMI Firth um, patch and uh, come up with detailed outcomes, uh, which are shown there. Hey, I mentioned that it's it's obviously the nine main issues are maybe the most important stuff. That this is, you may be aware of a document called the Highland Wide Local Development Plan, which sets out our policies across the whole. Of, Highland, that's quite dated now. It was uh, uh, adopted by the council in 2012. Uh, so obviously things have moved on an awful lot since. And, and these nine um, gray uh, shapes here are, are the nine main issues that we're asking the, the sort of general uh, public what they think of these issues. So uh, the two darker shades of gray there are what we think are the most important issues. So, you know, obviously we, we feel that the Climate change is, is one of the most important issues that the plan should address in the future. Economic recovery as well. Um, and then those are the, the other uh, issues, which I'll, I'll go into a, a short amount of uh, detail on each of them. Climate change, uh, the, there's various things the plan can do to affect that. Uh, a district heating uh, proposals so that the, the government are... Um, through Parliament at the moment are uh, passing a bill to, to become an act to, to uh, enforce the development industry to look at district heating proposals. So uh, future developments and uh, one of the policies or the draft draft approaches that we've got in this uh, main issues report is going to uh, coax developers to have district heating proposals within the larger sites. Um, enhancing green and blue space is the bottom left one there. Um, we're also going to trail through the main issues report, uh, a policy where developers will have to pay f um, to, if, if it's a greenfield development site, then they're going to be asked to pay uh, um, money towards uh, basically um, to plant more trees and to enhance um, the uh, green areas in, in close proximity to, to where their sites are. Economic recovery, um, uh, various uh, proposals, um, not too many major employment sites uh, within your ward, although uh, Douglas can cover uh, is is issues at NIG if, if you uh, uh, wish to, and the Freeport pro proposal as well. Um, Self-build, I think uh, Councillor Loudon has, a, has an interest in self-build and uh, you may be aware, members, that the new planning act brought in um, the duty for the council to maintain a list of those interested in self-build. Uh, one of the approaches we're proposing through this this plan is to uh, a, uh, ensure for the bigger sites that developers provide a certain proportion of their site for self-build. Um, so that's one example which will be uh, relevant uh, to your ward. Um, Settlement hierarchy, this is a load of planner jargon, I'm afraid, but basically we've for each place within the plan area, we've assigned a tier to each place. The higher up the tier you are, then the more growth the plan will seek to zone land for. So within your ward, you've got um, a Olness, Olness Invergordon, 
and teen uh, in the top tier. So we see that these places are having quite a bit of growth uh, zoned or uh, sites earmarked for building in those uh, places. Um, further down uh, tier two, we've got Everton, which is in your ward, and um, Seaboard Village, as you can see in tier three. Um, there's things called growing settlements. Again, I'm afraid a bit of planner jargon there, but there's the, the, this is tier five. So there's several uh, um, in your your uh, your ward that we've assigned to tier five. These are to have a certain amount of growth, but no um, allocated sites in them, and there's no detailed maps contained for those uh, places. Um, one of the other main issues to deliver more affordable housing, again, a change in the policy approach. You may be aware we normally seek 25% on um, sites of four or more houses for affordable, where, where there's the highest level of need, uh, we're um, considering and seeking development industry and local opinion on whether to increase that or not. Um, so that's one of the, the key the key changes getting proposed. Um, you might be aware a lot of the networks don't have sufficient capacity in them, so it's no good uh, talking about new building if there isn't sufficient capacity, whether it's fiber, sewage capacity, water capacity, road capacity. So um, through this site, we're going to be allocating fewer development sites than we have in the past, but we want them to be more viable and we want it to be cost efficient for the council to service all these sites as well. So when you when we come on to to look at the detail of each place on the maps, you'll see there, there are we are proposing fewer sites than we did in the current plan. Uh, part of the climate change agenda is trying to get uh, change the way people move around. A uh, hopefully with fibre improvements, people will have less need to move round. If they do need to move around, we want them. We want the pattern of development to. Um, make it easy for people to walk or cycle for the shorter trips that they make, go by public transport for the longer trips, and um, EV uh, if if uh, there is an any other option available. And that that approach uh, and that those aims have influenced the, the sites that we've put forward uh, for you to consider, which um, on on the maps. Um, local green space, I think during lockdown, a lot of us have gone out to walk, walk the dog or um, you know, realize how important it is to have a local place to, to walk. Um, so we are um, going to do a better audit. We don't really have a, a mapped information, very good mapped information on where green areas are. Uh, so we're proposing a better audit of where they are. We're uh, proposing a policy to better protect them. Uh, and uh, that's the basic approach on that. Uh, placemaking. Um, this is again uh, planner jargon that we use, but it means basically trying to encourage architects and developers to come up with better designs of houses uh, rather than wait for a planning application to arrive in and try and change it, which is very difficult. We're trying to, we've, uh, um, at the back of your papers, you'll see there's a, what's called a placemaking audit which is to um, get in early to influence architects and developers so that the design of the houses and the layout of the developments is far better before the pre-app or the planning application proposal arrives in. Um, the, you'll be aware, I'm sure, that the projections for the number of people in Highland and the older age groups, uh, there'll, there'll be a much higher proportion in, in the older age, age groups. Um, we're trailing a policy through this document to increase the quota for a, a wheelchair livable housing which is different to wheelchair accessible homes uh, it's 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 a better if you like uh, the scottish government's recently announced you may be aware at the end of september the proposed investment program for 2021 to 2026 and there is a a, a provision in there um for um, affordable housing agencies to give more funding towards this type of uh, housing. So uh, I think it, basically uh, if that comes into practice next year, uh, then it, it should be uh, far easier for us, for, for the affordable housing agencies to, to deliver uh, a higher proportion of wheelchair livable accommodation on their sites. And we're also asking the private developers to, to provide open market housing, which is, uh, um, you know, of that type as well. 
Uh, all these main issues and the hierarchy of settlements that I outlined in that table, uh, they're all summed up on a map. I won't go into the d d detail of that. Uh, I think one particular interest uh, to local members is the hinterland boundary. So we'll cover that in a wee bit of uh, d d detail. Um, in previous meetings, uh, ward briefings, um, a, and housing in the countryside workshops, uh, members in, in your two wards have expressed a desire that the hinterland be drawn back in East Ross. Uh, hopefully on this map, you can see that that's, uh, we've, as officers, we're, we're, we're happy to include that as, as an option. So you can see both of your wards, sorry, that the portion of the exist existing hinterland that is within both of your wards is going to appear within the document as a proposal to draw that back. Um, so that's that's um, included. I'll now, uh, sorry, I'll now hand over to um, my, uh, probably to Olness first, which is Julianne Bain, to take you through the detail of each of each place. Um, uh, if you bear with me, I'll have to switch switch maps. So uh, just before Julianne begins, can I just explain the colours on the maps? I think members, you've all had these in advance. Um, I, I don't know whether you've had paper or PDF uh, versions or or both, but uh, this this um, for each of these maps, the colours are very important. The green means, uh, uh, as an initial officer view, we think the green sites are the best sites. The amber sites uh, or orangey colour sites are the ones that we feel. Uh, in terms of the overall target, you know, I, I mentioned fewer but more viable sites. Uh, we think uh, that the orange sites uh, are not necessarily viable, uh, so it, we're not, as officers, recommending them to you. Uh, we we think the green ones are best, and on some of the other maps, you'll see sites which are red. Uh, these, as an officer view, we don't think these are very good sites at all, and uh, don't think they should be taken forward in their plan. Um, right, I'll hand over, that's me finished talking, you'd be glad to, glad to know, and I'll hand over to Julianne to take you through the detail of this settlement first. Thanks, Tim. Morning, members. Um, we'll start with Olness first. Um, as Tim set out, um, Olness is identified within the main issues report as a strategic growth centre. So we're looking at um, allocating more land for housing here than we would be in some other settlements. Um, there are uh, there are currently active housing sites being developed in the town at White Hills, Dalmore and Willow Bank Park. Uh, so they're all shown as green preferred sites. Um, also showing preferred sites at Derek Bray West um, and a phase one of Cross Hills. Um, the remainder of um, housing growth is shown as being preferred at Allness East, um, primarily on land at White Hills and at Nulnafua Farm, um, which because these are closest to the town centre and the existing services. Uh, the remainder of the land at Allness East, uh, apart from the allotments, um, is shown as alternative, uh, the amber colour. And this is because um, it's considered that these are areas that are more suitable for longer term expansion. So focusing on the areas around White Hills and Milnafua Farm first. Um, for the for the land further east, um, it's quite likely that a new or upgraded junction onto the A9 will be required. Um, there are also a number of business and industrial sites shown all as preferred, which um, uh, is positive for the town that there's a, there's a number of options there. Um, Allness Point continues to be preferred as well. Um, uh, a, a minor, well, it's not a minor point. Um, within the text of for Allness for the town text, um, when it was written, the academy hadn't actually opened. Obviously, it has now opened, so the text, the, the settlement text, will be updated to reflect that the new academy is now open. 
Um, do you want to move to Evans and Tim? Sure. Okay, so within the settlement hierarchy, Everton, Everton is identified as suitable for modest amounts of growth. Um, the village is in a situation where there are two large sites, one at Kilcairn and one at Tiendallan, which both have planning permission. Kilcairn has planning in principle for 160 houses and at Tiendallan there's permission for 140. Um, it's unlikely that the entirety of both of these sites will be required uh, during the lifetime of this plan. So you will see on the map that for both sites, there is a small portion identified as green and the remainder um, identified as alternative. The green for both is the phase one of both sites. Um, and it's felt that it's it's more likely it's more viable and likely that the phase one of both sites will be delivered and looking at the remainder of both sites as being longer term expansion areas for the village. Um, one other point to draw to your attention is that we've included a placemaking priority to reopen the rail halt. Uh, this is an aspiration, but it's there so that if funding does become available, um, that it's something that the plan would support. OK, Tim. That's, do you want to move to Inver Gordon, Tim? Yeah, I think we're on it now. Oh, Douglas. sorry. Douglas, are you there? Are you on mute, Douglas? Right. Um, While well, Douglas finds himself, can we maybe go on to um, Seaboard? Sorry, I'm, I'm, oh. can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry, perfect timing. It just seemed to drop off just as Julian was doing Edmonton. Can you hear me okay now? Yes. Excellent. Morning, members. So, Invergarden here, it's um, identified in the top tier of the settlement hierarchy, and that's because of the wide variety of uh, facilities on offer in Invergarden, the employment opportunities in the town, and its good transport links. Um, there have been, in the existing adopted plan, that there are quite a number of large allocations with uh, potential for over a thousand housing sites, yet the reality has been that <clears throat> only one small allocation in the centre of the town was actually delivered in the last five years. So um, the the economic side is a bit different. There have been uh, a development on some of the employment related allocations. So taking that on board and looking at other issues across the town, the placemaking priorities uh, highlight the support for the redevelopment uh, and reuse of the brownfield sites in the in the town. Also to improve the connectivity and general appearance of the entrance uh, around the harbour and the western side of the, or sorry, the southern side of the harbour. Um, this includes addressing uh, cruise ship traffic problems, um, cruise ship related traffic problems. Um, so looking at the sites themselves, we are essentially trying to to rationalise the sites that were previously allocated, whilst also considering the sites that were su suggested to us at the call for sites. Um, the priority has been uh, looking at the sites which are closest to facilities which provide natural infill opportunities um, and and essentially those those with developer interest uh, genuine developer interest so those the main housing sites there are Invergarden Mains, the first phase, the Orange Site IG08 that represents a longer longer term phases of that development. Uh, Cromlet is, uh, is a key site and also there's interest in the 
in taking forward certain uh, parts of the disused fuel tank uh, site in the centre of the village. So they are the main housing uh, components. The, we're basically reallocating many of the employment uh, sites, industrial estates and land at the harbour and uh, a mixed use opportunity at the south of the railway, southwest of the railway station. We're also allocating a town centre boundary in the centre of the village, not shown in this, but shown in the main issues report itself, um, which we'll all be looking, uh, seeking views on. So that's in Vergarden. Thank you. Uh, Julianne, back to you for Seaboard Villages. Julianne, are you, are you on mute? Yes, I was on mute, sorry. So Seaboard Villages um, is in the settlement hierarchy uh, is shown as a uh, for limited amount of growth. Uh, there are a number of existing allocations, um, none of which have been developed. Um, so the intention is to focus growth on the site uh, beside the primary school. So that's SB01. Um, it benefits from having planning and principle for some housing. Um, there are two preferred sites shown for business and light industry, SB03, Ballantour Industrial Estate, which is an existing allocation, and Tim, slight, not shown on the map, but slightly further north, um, it's out with, it's SB04, um, Cadball Industrial Estate. This was a new site that came forward through the call for sites, um, and we're, um, we're indicating that um, it's a preferred a potential preferred site for uh, for business and light industrial use. Um, the uh, one other point, if you scroll back down further south a bit, Tim. Um, the the site SB02 land south of Shore Street is an existing allocation a. Uh, for housing business and a small amount of tourism use. Uh, through the call for sites, the, there was a request to extend the site further south. You'll see that it's shown as alternative. Uh, and this is due mainly to um, flooding issues uh, become more of a problem uh, the further south you go along that site. Um, and one final point within the within the text of the settlement it's identified or it's noted that there may be opportunities to seek developer contributions towards a dial -a bus service for the village. Okay, if we move on to Tien. So Tien is another one uh, that is another town that's identified as a strategic growth centre. Um, there were a number of uh, new sites um, put forward during the call for sites exercise, um, which are on the which are beyond the bypass, beyond the A9. You'll see that those are all shown as red, non-preferred. Um, if we reflect back on what Tim was saying uh, in his part of the presentation about uh, the the priorities for the plan uh, in terms of climate change, in terms of reducing the amount of travel. Um, it's felt that within Tian there are adequate sites within which are on the other side of the A9 within the town, um, which can provide housing, which are all within active travel range of all of the services in the town. Um, the delivery of the 3D18 campus is obviously a long term held aspiration. Um, the site TN01 behind Craigle Primary School is the likely preferred option. Um, the way that uh, I'm proposing to deal with this in the main issues report is identifying the site behind Craigle Primary School 
and the existing academy site, both as preferred mixed use sites. Um, obviously, there is there is no planning application in for the academy, um, but uh, TN01 is likely to be the preferred location. If that is the case, then the existing academy site becomes a vacant site, uh, which is it's a really good central, well located site, um, and it would be able to provide um, a sensitive amount of um, housing and potentially some other um, uh, uses within it. Um, so whilst both TN01 and TN02 are shown as green, the reality is, is that moving forward, it will be one or the other that will be identified um, as a site for development. Um, thanks, Tim. The other thing, the one other thing to point out to you, um, land at Knockbrick Road, which is TN08, yes, TN08, um, you'll see the, the majority of that land is shown as amber. Um, there was also a request to the call for sites to extend that allocation further south. That's shown at TN15. Um, TN8 ha has got a master plan for it. Um, there has been nothing come forward on the site, uh, nothing uh, as that has come on it, but there's been no housing development um, uh, being developed uh, over this last number of years. A small part of it, uh, which is shown as green TN03, um, there is a high likelihood of that being pursued and actually being a viable deliverable site, which is why that is, is shown as a preferred site. Um, it's likely that with either the site behind Creekle Primary School or the uh, existing academy site that they will provide enough housing for the town. Um, but uh, it'll be out for discussion with, with the main issues report. Um, and the, the final thing I'm going to draw your attention to is site TN11, the Grove. Um, I don't want any alarm bells ringing that it's showing as red, non-preferred. That's, that's basically a reflection of the size of the site. Um, it's a much smaller site than what we would normally allocate. Um, but there is supportive text within uh, the settlement text. Um, uh, supporting its redevelopment. Uh, so whilst it's shown as red non-preferred, um, there is text there to support the redevelopment of the site. That's it, Tim. Okay, thank you very much. Members, of just one final slide, um, which I'll hopefully call up on the presentation again. It's just really uh, Para 6.1 of your report. Uh, seeks your approval of the consultation arrangements that we are proposing. Um, hopefully you can see that, but it's basically uh, at least eight weeks. We've got, I mentioned that there's five area committee meetings that we're going to. The last of those is uh, the Nansha one at the beginning of December. Um, we're likely not to publish this main issues report until the beginning of next year. Uh, as I say, at least eight weeks. Um, face to face, the government advice currently is that no face-to-face -face events are going to be allowed. Uh, however, we will uh, probably look at a longer period to consult on, on this. And uh, if government guidance has changed towards the end of, uh, of that longer time frame, then uh, we'll, we'll certainly have a look at face-to-face um, um, -face events at that time if we can. Uh, we are going to neighbour notify. In fact, we may send a flyer to every single household. So just to ensure that people are um, aware of the plan and their chance to make their views known. Uh, seeking greater articles in the press, use of social um, media as well. So those those are the um, the options really and what we propose and how we propose to consult people at the beginning of next year. And that's uh, outlined in paragraph 6.1 of the report. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you, members. That's me finished. Any points you, you wish to raise? 
OK, thank you, Tim, Julianne and Douglas. Thank you to the three of you for a very comprehensive and, and an easy to follow report as well. Um, we've got a number of questions from members and um, Maxine's first. Um, yeah, first of all, Chairman, um, I'll come back later for my questions, but Pauline and I realised that we didn't know you were going to go into such, such depth, so we need to declare an interest. Um, so can I declare a financial interest as Chairman of Albin Housing? However, I've applied the test and I won't be seeking to influence anything that will benefit Albin in this discussion, so I will stay. And I think Pauline's got a similar issue. Thank you. Pauline? Yeah, obviously, I sorry if you and I should have declared an interest like Maxine. I didn't know we'd go into such detail, which was great, by the way. Thank you for that. But yeah, there's there's quite a bit of land there that's a uh, family land. So I, I really should declare an interest. And I'm not very sure whether I, I should stay or go. I mean, I'll take your lead on that, Fiona. I'm not sure. OK, thank you, Pauline. Um, it's entirely it's a member decision whether you should um, stay or go. It's entirely your own decision whether you want to stay um, and not comment. You're on mute, Polly. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I'll just stay. I'll, I just won't comment. Okay. That, that'll make a nice change, Fiona. <laughs> OK, do you want to go back to Maxine? Would you like to ask your questions, Maxine? Yes, thank you for that. Um, yeah, um, I note that there's two red areas um, in the Invergordon um, land uh, plan that, that have been removed and I think I know where they are and I don't have an issue with that um, so I'm kind of okay I think with the Invergordon zoning at the moment and yeah I know um, none of the developments were taken forward in the five years except for the one at Cromlet with the council however um, the council did seek to purchase some of the land that was zoned but it wasn't forthcoming or easily negotiated with the landowner so I, I kind of don't want to rule that out so my, my question really is um, so if suddenly uh, a landowner did come forward in the previously zoned housing land uh, saying, look, you know, we can sell you this, then it is still possible to take that to planning, isn't it? It would just be recommended probably to say, you know, it's not in, in the plan, but we could look at it. So I just wondered, you know, if that's a possibility, um, which I think it is. Um, second thing is, I'm um, just a little bit wondering what Tim meant when he said, um, you're going to put a line around in Vergorda and I thought there was already a line around um, so I'm wondering how that changes um, is it a tighter line around the settlement area because I don't know if Tim was part of all our planning discussions and, and how to change planning but we did want that more lenient we kind of wanted um, people to be able to maybe build you know do a self build on a plot um, and make the settlement area a little wider so maybe if I could get a little clarity on that then I might come back later thank you Fiona. Chair, I think you're on mute. Yeah. Sorry, Tim, would you like to address those? Yep, certainly. Uh, the housing and the, the countryside uh, pop, pop policy, yes. Um, in relation to self self build, um, the existing Highland Wire policy already allows for um, a affordable housing self build if that affordable housing cannot be met within the nearby town. So. Um, uh, I think Councillor Loudon uh, previously has mentioned the Croft Arthur site just out with Tain, and uh, that's maybe a, a good example of where uh, I think council owned and and a, an affordable housing agency could take uh, forward a development on that site, uh, which could have um, affordable house uh, sorry self build affordable housing on it, and there could maybe be potential for open market self build plots as well. Uh, but we need the evidence first, uh, and as I say, with the councils, very soon, every council very soon is going to have to maintain a list of uh, people who have an interest in self-build plots. So we'll have better, um, better, better information on on what the local demand and need is for self-build, and armed with that data, uh, if there's no sites within the town or village uh, of a boundary. Uh, which may well be the case in Tain, then um, it's at that point that we could consider um, self-build developments out with the defined line. Uh, you know, as I say, we uh, we do have to define a, a settlement development area boundary for every village and town, and that is we, we're trying to concentrate most development within that line if we can. 
Uh, but but as I say, if if there's um, an unmet uh, housing need in uh, if it if it is an affordable self build need, and we have a, a list of how many people want to get a self build plot, and that need or demand we can't meet that within the settlement development area boundary, then that's uh, the way that we could we could allow that type of development out with any line that is defined in the plan. On your other point, uh, which was about the, w w does it rule it out? If it's shown as amber or red, does it rule out a developer or a landowner or uh, any agency wanting to take a site forward? Um, not yet. Uh, I mentioned right at the, the, the beginning of the, 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 um, the talk that the, we don't fix the council's position until next year. Okay, so there'll be red, amber, green sites. These are site options. We're asking um, landowners, developers, everybody uh, for their views early next year, whether they agree with the red, red, amber, green that we're showing on all of the maps. Do they agree that we are uh, trying to favor certain sites ahead of other sites? So there'll be a, a, a very clear opportunity for anybody who's upset that their site is shown as red or amber. Uh, the, the part, the, uh, the reason for the main issues report is to al allow those landowners or other agencies or local people to give us a formal opinion on what they think of the red, amber, green um, site options. We've already, as you might imagine, we've had a lot of uh, landowners and developers seeing the sites we've shown as orange or red who are already upset and are commenting and they're gearing up to write in on on the the uh, main issues report which will uh, publish at the beginning of ne ne next year. Members will have, as I said, we're coming back to the area committees next year. You'll have a, a, a paper produced for you which will set out all the comments people have made and it's it's only then that you have to make a final choice. So if you think we've got the wrong red, amber or green, or if anybody else thinks we've got the, red, the wrong sites as red, amber or green, there's that formal process to go through. Uh, so any upset party will have their, their chance in, in making a formal written, written view. So for example, I think there was a site a site done in Gordon where the um, an affordable housing a agency felt it was a viable site, and, and yet we'd shown it as orange. Uh, that I think that landowner and affordable ha housing agency will write in in a formal way uh, s to set out why they think it, it is a viable site and should be confirmed in the plan next year. Okay, thank you, Tim. Next, we have Alistair Rind. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks for the report. It's uh, quite a heavy report, but it's uh, got some positivities about it, but also got many negativities about it. Uh, but if I can just go through village by village, as it's in the port, so page 96, the seabird villages. So uh, quite happy what's mentioned here. The only thing I would say about the seabird villages, it's uh, they're a very active community. Um, they're doing much more to promote their, the great things they have for the tourist industry. Uh, there has been some deals in developing a caravan park in that community, but uh, it's finding it difficult to find mm -hmm. land for that. There is plenty of land there, but maybe landowners aren't the, the aren't they favourable to accepting any proposals? So as I would be interested for us to have a wee look at that and see if when the main report comes out, if there could be an allocation for a caravan park somewhere in the seaboard villages. I think we've got to encourage these communities. Things have changed over the past number of years and leisure is getting so much important for your people can come and enjoy holidays, et cetera, in these kind of communities. So I think we've got to also, you know, work is very important. The industrial estates in those communities are important, creates jobs, but also the tourism industry is going to create many more jobs, hopefully in the years to come. Uh, turning to Tain, quite disappointed with Tain, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, this was the discussion that uh, Mr. Stock just took in there and the previous speaker 
talk about all these areas of land that are allocated at this moment in time for development and pain. So that's true. But there's also these other areas on the other side of the bypass where people would like to develop, but they're restrained from developing it. And, you know, I think this uh, time came, I think Stockwell Gardner spoke a year ago saying to us, if these landowners that have land sown within Tain itself, but are unwilling to develop it, then we should take that sowing away from them. And uh, I don't know how how further down the road we are, but all the land sown in Tain for, for housing development, you know, the, these uh, landowners are not moving forward. And personally, I feel that there's a need in the town for self-build plots. There's a need in the town for more social housing. We're doing a, Albans doing a development at the moment the, on the other side of the bypass for 30 odd houses, so that's good. But there's further land within that area owned by a developer that could, could be developed for self-build plots. But because we've got the land at the Aska Junction all sown for housing, because we've got the land at Glen Modernji, near the, the Modern House Hotel, sown for housing, because we've got the land at Craig Hill, which was sown for housing, but will be the school now, you know, we're, we're not moving forward. So the, the town has been stagnant for well over five years now because of the reluctance of the planning system to allow housing developments over the side of the bypass. And really, you know, we, we can't continue to be saying you've got plenty of land within the town centre area or within the bypass area to be developed first. If these landowners that sit on that land are unwilling to develop, then we should not be holding back the growth of the town because of that. So that was just that point. You know, on, on page 100, it talks to the town centre environment, the first. Alistair, I think if you could talk forward into the mic, oh, you're right here and, right. and you went off to the side. Thank you. Right. Maybe it's good you didn't hear what I was saying there. But anyway, uh, it's a job reading the papers. And, you know, one of the items in the papers talks about protecting the town centre and the historical core of the town centre. So that's really the conservation area. And, you know, sadly, again, the conservation area is holding back the development of the town centre because of the costs it puts on projects to have the proper windows in, the proper doors, don't change the feature of the buildings, these kind of things, adds a colossal amount of money. And, you know, if I'm sure you all know that the town centre and the dire streets that they're in at the moment and the state of the buildings, you know, need hundreds of thousands of pounds spent on them to bring them up to an acceptable standard to see if we can encourage people to use them. So the planning, I think, need to be more sympathetic to the conservation area and more sympathetic to those that want to develop it, because technically the conditions that the planning put on are costing developers many thousands of pounds more and makes, makes, the, makes the, the project unaffordable then. You know, it also talks about the Glenmorangie Modern G Distillery. Well, you know, the path between Glen Modern G Distillery and Tain is much needed. And if we, you know, that that would be something that that could boost the, the town centre redevelopment if there was that pathway. I know it's a long way from Glen Modern G to uh, into the town centre, but many people would walk that, but also electric bikes, that kind of thing would be made available. So I hope that's something that we could uh, look at there. And I was interested in the points that Mr. Stock made about Cross Arthur. Well, Cross Arthur on, on the other side of the bypass, so it's just the same really with all the other uh, bits that are marked out and read at this moment uh, on the previous comments I made. So just looking at the you know, the other building, it was mentioned about the Grove. There is a live planning application in for that at the moment. It's been in for a considerable time. So we could do with getting an update what's happening there. 
we I looked at that building assembly this morning and you know it's a shame to see that building in our town centre in the state that is in and I think planning meet, need to take a more active role there with the owners of the property to see what can be done there. So that was that one. I'm sorry there's quite a few things here. Barbaraville, well you know it's years and years and years we've been hearing about this development at Barbaraville this uh, taking away the level crossing, putting over the uh, a new bridge, uh, and then the development of the houses there. I mean, every planning meeting on the major developments, you know, it never changes what it sees about it. And I think I think we need to for for that community. You know, there's mixed views in that community. That needs to be pulled forward one way or the other. Hell of far, and I really don't have anything to say there. In the, we'll leave that to Fiona to see. Milton of Kildare, I don't really have anything to say there. Uh, Port Mahomet, well, I, again, Port Mahomet is, uh, you know, very much a, a tourist uh, a facility. And, you know, I, I'm glad to see in page 112, it talks about support the local community with efforts to enhance the harbour and its facilities. So that was quite an interesting comment I read after a meeting I had with somebody from the harbour there just on, on Tuesday. Um, you know, let's hope that that is true, that the Highland Council want to engage with that community to allow them to develop the harbour and its facilities. So it's all right writing those words. That's a simple thing to do is write that on paper. The harder thing is to put it into reality and, you know, I know this is the planning service. I know it's a different service that deal with the harbour. But, you know, I, I hope this cohesion between the two services, that that statement will be followed through for that, that community. And then uh, I come to NEG. So I was, I was surprised that NEG wasn't mentioned uh, in the talk that the officers gave. And, you know, NEG's a very important uh, industrial facility for us all in, in the Highlands generally and I'm a bit concerned and I would like uh, the officers to come back to me but have landowners been in discussion with you about NEG because you know we we've got a huge allocation of land at NEG you know you've got where the existing site is at this moment in time you've got the uh, the old oil refinery site on a lot of other land around all that is uh, allocated for industrial use. Now, there may be through time other reasons to have other allocations of land there. Maybe somebody wants, for example, to do a leisure development in that area. Now, so this full allocation of in, in industrial land would preclude that from happening. And, uh, you know, what I, I would like to see is that we, we certainly put into the plan some mention of possible leisure uh, use of that land down there as well. I don't think it's a case of taking all the land that's allocated away from industrial, but certainly a proportion of that taken away or, or marked for both uh, leisure or industrial. And my understanding is that officers were having discussions about that, so I would, would be keen to hear your comments on that. I think that's all at the moment. Sorry it's so much. But Thank you, Alistair. I think it would be good just before you address Tim that we move on to Derek and just get his comments too, because probably they overlap. So it would make sense to answer all the, the local members at the same time. Okay. Derek. Uh, I'm afraid, um, like uh, Maxine and Pauline, um, I um, wasn't aware of uh, the level of detail that would be gone into um, I do have a, a relative who had a, a land a zoned, I think it's area TN07, um, and uh, I think, um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to make, um, make my comments um, known, um, but I'm not I, I'm also um, 
not sure. It's the same relative who we had the problem with um, on Scottsburn Road <laughs> um, when I wasn't able to comment on the, the site uh, the school uh, site selection um, and there's an awful lot I want to say. Um, I'll, I'll be perfectly honest, I've never been so angry since I've been elected. Everything that I suggested, um, the opposite has been proposed. So I think it's best that I, I don't comment. I, I'm, I, I, I really, I can't speak. OK, Derek, thank you. I've noted, noted your comments. I can add in my comments just now as a local member, Tim, so that you okay. can address them at the same time as, as Alistair's. I've got a few points here. The first one you mentioned about 25% affordable housing and there's changes being proposed. Mm -hmm. um, if you could outline those changes to us um, and also to indicate, are you looking at um, a variable percentage based on need in each area and if we could have more information on that please. The second point was looking at the dial a bus for seaboard which is very welcome and um, that makes such a difference in many of our communities so I would hugely support that um, and like that to move forward. On TAIN um, I absolutely disagree that there is adequate housing to meet all the needs within TAIN. Um, yes, there are a number of sites, but they don't meet people who want to do self-build, particularly larger, more rural self-build. And I think it's absolutely essential that you continue to develop across the bypass, which is where many people want to build their houses and there's particularly good sites. So I'm very much against not zoning that um, and making that available. Um, I think that having a longer period to consult is a really good thing. I think it's it's essential just now with, with all that's going on that you extend that time and that you advertise it widely. I agree with Alistair that there is a need for a caravan park at Seaboard and I would like to see that developed. The Grove in Tain, um, Highland Council really do need to step in and offer support to get this dealt with. Um, it really does have a negative impact on our town centre and it's been dragging on a long, long time. Um, and I think we do need much more intervention from Highland Council on that. Going on to NEG, um, I would absolutely agree with Alistair that we need to look at the zoning there. The current allocation, I believe, is stifling alternative opportunities that there might be for leisure, for tourism. Um, and I know that there have been discussions going on about that and I really, believe that we need to look at the allocation and make it either um, leisure and tourism or a multi-use zoned area. Um, moving to Inver, which Alistair said I would mention, um, you've not mentioned the school, all the other villages you talk about the school capacity, Inver you miss out, it has a particularly good school, a very popular school, um, so I think that's just an omission on your part. Um, I think you've far too restrictive on housing in Inver. I know there's been a number of people who would like to build in Inver and they would particularly like to be closer to the village within walking distance of the hall of the school, but they've been very much restricted because there hasn't been the availability of, of sites around the edges of the village. Um, there's also this idea that we can't have rows of housing, that there's got to be um, a certain type of development but it's very hit and miss. Sometimes it's applied, sometimes it's not. Um, so I'm aware of people that have tried to build a house that have got turned down because it would be a row of housing. And then maybe a year or two later, another house has been allowed and it just adds to that row of housing. Um, there doesn't seem to be logic in it at all and people can't understand um, why some are allowed and why some are not. Um, I certainly think they should be allowed. There is a desire to increase um, the housing within that village and I think that has to be encouraged. I think that was all the, the notes that I had. Um, and just, just to mention about Evanton, it's great news that you're very supportive of the railway station development at Evanton. Um, and I think as a committee, we would like to endorse that. 
So that's all my comments. And um, if you could address them, and then we can move on to back to Tom to her with Mike's. Will do. Thanks, Chair. Um, I'll call on Julianne and Douglas to deal with uh, um, some of the local detail I'm not aware of, but um, trying to go through all, all of the comments raised. Uh, Alistair Ryan mentioned the, uh, sorry, yourself and Chair and Alistair Ryan mentioned the caravan park idea for seaboard for villages. I think that's a good idea and one, a change that we could make as officers as um, the landowner approaches through the call for sites process for the large area at the south end. And um, Julianne just showed the map showing it as, as um, not as a preferred site. It was largely housing, I think, that the landowner had in mind, but I think it would be reasonable to um, be supportive of a tourism proposal on that land. And as I say, I, th I think the, the landowner is open to other options on that land. So uh, basically we could we could show it as a preferred tourism site rather than a alternative housing site. I, th I think uh, unless Julianne says I'm wrong, I think it was a it was a housing proposal that came through the call the call for sites uh, pr process, not a tourism one. The existing allocation, which is shown as SBO2, is an allocation for mixed use. And one of the uh, uses in that mixed use is tourism. Um, and uh, that that was to allow for a potential caravan site there because that was a, a discussion uh, with the landowner uh, during the the review of the of IMF1. Um, so within that exists within the allocation in the existing plan, uh, uh, the land SBO2 would allow for a caravan site there. So, but but that's that's not the current uh, recommendation, though, is it? In this no, in this plan? Uh, the the recommendation for SBO2 is to continue the allocation uh, for mixed use, including tourism right. use so on that site. So it's carrying forward. Um, the existing allocation, which would allow for a, a caravan site on that site at the moment. Okay, okay, okay. thank you. Um, the other points raised, the TAIN, yeah, I, 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 most members, I think, um, are, are saying that they're unhappy with the red um, sites out with the uh, bypass line. Um, one option, well, the options available to you uh, members are to uh, let the main issues report go out as it is in the appendix and then see what the public say, what the landowners say, and then make your final decision next next year. Or the other option available to you is to is to, to make the change now. And um, uh, but as I say that the, the the officer reasons for trying to show the sites out with the bypass is red is that we think we have sufficient viable sites within the bypass line. Uh, we think from a, an active travel point of view and, and um, clo closeness to the town centre, we think these are better sites. It's, it's as I said at the beginning, the main issues that we've highlighted, our site selection is based upon those. So from a, you know, for example, from a, climate change point of view, um, rural development uh, it doesn't address that. Um, and where we can, uh, then we should uh, direct most development within a, a town or a village uh, boundary. And that's the reason the, the, officer, the officers have shown uh, most central sites as green and most sites that are not very close to uh, the centre of any town or village shown them as red. So um, as I say, it, it's it's up to our members, you know, what what the actual main issues report c contains in terms of the uh, the council's views on the site options. Uh, and as I say, you can either change the red, or amber, green um, uh, notations on the map before we uh, publish this, and then invite um, public and landowner developer views on that. Or you can wait and see what the public and the landowners and say, and then um, a, uh, react once you've seen all of the views. Um, I would say that I, I, what what we said to all the other landowners and, and uh, 
the developers who've complained about their sites being amber or red is we've said, give us a written comment on the main issues report when it goes out and say why your red site is more viable and effective than the green sites that we have on the map. So we're really trying to seek uh, formal written views from landowners, developers and other people who who think we've made the wrong choice of sites. So um, I'd say that those are the options uh, open to you and uh, the reasons that officers have shown the colours that we have shown now. Um, but yeah, as I say, if, if Evident, if there is sufficient evidence that the green sites we've got within the bypass are not viable, yeah, um, then, as I, you know, as I say, that's a very powerful reason to uh, change the, the red sites out with the bypass from red to amber or to uh, green. But officers uh, don't, um, from the work that we've done so far, we don't, we think that the, uh, the, the sites within the bypass are more viable. For, um, and it, you know, obviously, there's a cost to the council to service all of these sites as well. So, we've we've got one eye on that as well. So, as I say, if 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 there's evidence available to change the colour of any of the sites, then uh, you know, obviously, there is that option available to change those colours before the main issues report comes out at the beginning of next year, or you can wait and see what all the formal views are, and then make your final minds up next year. Um, so that's teen uh, and you, the options available. Um, Port Mahomet, yes, we will talk to the harbour team uh, to see whether they can um, align their funding with the the idea that we have in the plan. We'll take that as an action. Um, uh, the school at Inver, um, yes, I think uh, we can uh, beef up the placemaking priorities, which is basically the the text that goes with the inverse section, we can add in the um, the uh, add in uh, further growth potential there. I think um, the when we had the meeting with the Goldsby area office about that issue, it was I think it was pressure for development out with Inver at the main road junction. I think that's what the area office planners had a concern with, and that's why the, the there isn't um, an open-ended support for for growth within the the text that that's in there now. Um, a, the chair, you mentioned the the twenty five percent policy and how it might be changed and where it might be changed. Uh, yeah, we're, we're looking at the, the the detailed wording in that section talks about increasing it from twenty five to thirty five percent. So that's the that's the increase that's uh, put forward within the text, and it's in areas of highest housing need. So, you know, obviously the, uh, there's the Highland Housing Housing Register, uh, which is a combined waiting list of the council and the affordable housing agencies. And so, where where the and um, we have meetings with all those agencies every month, and uh, they they. Um, they are keen that it's applied. They only they only want to apply it where it's viable, but because obviously they don't want to undermine um, whether a, a site is viable for a house builder to take forward. If 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 we increase the percentage too high too high, then it, it becomes an unviable site for the for the housing developer to take forward, and we don't get the 25% of plots that we would have got if we hadn't hiked hiked it up. So so that's um, uh, as I say, it's the 25 to 35 percent proposal that's in um, in Appendix One, uh, but that will only be applied where the uh, the housing the affordable housing agencies agree that, that it's going to be viable on that particular site, and uh, where there is proven need need as well. Um, I think that's most of, apart from Nig. Sorry, I haven't covered Nig. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Douglas Chisholm because uh, I think um, Councillor Rind and others mentioned that there have been meetings with uh, the various landowners there, and Douglas is the one who's been party to those and can provide an update. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Um, just to go back for just to touch on that affordable housing policy, we are just now there's a flat rate of 25% across you're either in it or you aren't in terms of whether the policy applies and it so it works quite well however there are certain places where we're, where there's a real struggle to address that housing needs such as in Inverness um, 
but it is a sensitive issue that may make sites completely unviable. They won't come forward and then you won't get delivery of any housing. So we, as we've set out in the plan, we are really keen to get people's opinions on how that may work. Essentially, how can we increase the amount of affordable housing in places where it's needed the most? You know, we're just looking at the options which the plan has available to it to address that. So we're definitely wanting feedback from all different stakeholders on that issue. Um, in terms of NIG, in terms of uh, other comments about tourism just now, it, tourism in general, it's touched upon in the uh, economy main issue up the front in the strategy section. There's a, there's a subsection identified as sustainable tourism and the, the un, underdeveloped tourism industry in Easter Ross is identified and opportunities to better exploit that. It's on, you know, the, the North Coast 500 goes through both wards yet we feel that there's far more that can be done to tap into that resource, that uh, uh, growth industry. <clears throat> so there is reference to that and that will be developed <clears throat> and taken forward into the proposed plan, into the strategy side of things. Uh, in terms of NIG itself, we've had you know, ongoing conversations with um, with Global Energy, it's the operators of NIG Yard, and also the landowners that adjoin, uh, that adjoin <clears throat> the yard itself. Uh, there was a master plan pre uh, prepared in 2008, which was adopted as supplementary guidance for NIG's uh, redevelopment and potential expansion to the east side of the B Road, uh, going through the NIG Peninsula. And, um, We've been looking at that closely, looking at the allocation as it stands in, in that in that document. There's a bit of a history here. There's a master plan that has one boundary. There's Highland White that has a slightly different boundary. There's Inner Muddy Firth, the development plan from 2015 that has another slightly different boundary. What we want to do is reach a position which is which is clear, which states what we want to accept and provide that updated position. And, you know, if Tim was to scan up just briefly, you'll see that there is quite a lot of, um, uh, keep going Tim, there's quite a lot of uh, context here. There's a lot of issues to deal with. You know, when you look at other uh, economic development areas, there, there may be far fewer. What we're, the, the sort of the content there reflects some of the issues we're trying to deal with, recognizing that there's a new landowner who's, uh, purchased a lot of the land east of NIG and you know they are working uh, constructively to try and develop uh, and, and re regenerate that area through uh, golf, uh, golf course development whilst also accommodating global energy's potential long-term aspirations to uh, to expand their site so yeah close work and relationships with all stakeholders uh, ongoing and uh, looking to find that position which allows for for these developments to go ahead. There's most of the things I was wanting to touch on. Thank you. I think you have you have covered um, what we've addressed um, Alistair and I um, what I would like to say is that I'm pleased that you commented that in NIG you are working constructively um, with the, the new landowner and because I feel we really need to encourage and support them. As you say, the economy is so important um, and moving forward, we have to support local businesses more now than ever. And we have to look at how we can improve our area, make it more viable and um, look at tourism, look at culture and leisure. Um, and this is an area that we could really benefit from. So I think we have to do everything in our power to try and encourage and help this. Um, and I would certainly be in favour of um, multi-zoning it so that, it, that there was um, a very easy route to take where that to move ahead and become, as you say, a potential golf course. Um, we have to make that very easy so that there aren't um, obstacles put in their path by, by anyone at all. 
I would also say from my point of view that I would be keen to make the changes now that we have proposed 14, um, looking at having much wider sites, particularly across the bypass, rather than waiting, as you, you also suggest. I don't know what Councillor Rind thinks on that, um, but I certainly feel that we need to increase the boundary of Tain, that those sites, although they're more rural, they're still within walking distance of the town centre. So in terms of the climate change proposals, um, they would certainly fit within there. And I would be keen to see the changes now. Alistair, would you like to comment your hands up? Your, your mic, you need to unmute. Uh, is that me? Yep. Yeah, yeah, very much agree with what you've said there, Fiona. I, I think, uh, you know, there's been adequate time for people on the other side of the bypass, on the Tain side of the bypass, to develop their land, and they haven't done it. And, you know, it was interesting before the, the school was going on the, the development site at Craig Hill School, you know, Morrisons, who, who owned the site, put a notice up there for people to to buy plots, and they had about 15 interests in that. And I'm sure there's much more interest nowadays that people are wanting to develop their own houses and on individual plots. And I, I think that, you know, that option should be given. What are we approving today? The main issues report, we're putting it out for consultation. Well, let's give people and landowners the options of, you know, development in Tain where the sites are already sown or these other sites that could be possibly sown for that. And it's the same with NEG. We have to give the people the the option, uh, you know, leisure is so, so important, and it's even more important now since COVID's come upon us. And um, if somebody's wanting to develop a leisure facility on the land that they own, but at this moment in time, it's sown for industrial. Well, there's adequate land down there. And uh, I think, again, it should go out in the main issues report that this is a consideration, not taking away all the land from the Neg Energy Park, but a small proportion of that could be used for leisure facilities. Thank you. OK, thank you, Alistair. Is there anything else you want to bring in, Douglas? Uh, yes, so Tim just had that Neg map up, so it doesn't it doesn't show you that the, the, the what is currently allocated, but basically the allocation is represent. So the land to the south wet um, southeast there, where Tim's cursor is essentially, that that's where there is a current allocation covering that for industrial use. But that's essentially where um, the golf course would be looking to to be positioned. And um, you know, the initial reaction might be, well, it's next to a, a big industrial uh, centre, but actually, it also adds a bit of uh, uniqueness to the proposal. And you know, it sits there, sort of juxtaposed against the 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 landscape of the Cromarty Firth with the industrial uh, port and and rigs in the Firth. So, you know, in principle, this uh, this the, the 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 golf course uh, has a lot of merit, and and you know we think it can be compatible with those uses, and the allocations reflect that uh, reflect both the the ambitions of of Nig as far as as we know, and uh, and the landowner. OK, thank you, Douglas. OK, moving on, we have Mike Finlayson. Yeah, thank you, Fiona. Um, and thank you for your support regarding the rail halt, possible rail halt at Edmonton, and it's in the plan, as, or proposed to be in the plan anyway. So that, that's good, and pleased to see about that. Um, now, I don't know what the status is with regard to the Freeport application, uh, but if that does come to Gordon, then allocation of industrial land would become even more important. And uh, I would assume that the Edmonton uh, <clears throat> industrial estate would be part of that development uh, that's possibly for people uh, 
the businesses to come. Uh, with that in mind, the old plan did show a, a spar off that railway line into the industrial estate, and uh, that might be worth uh, reconsidering uh, once the allocation, once the application for Freeport is accepted. <laughs> I'm being positive there. Um, now, with regard to um, Fiona mentioned the school at Ember. I must mention the school at Evanton as well. That's worthy of consideration, considering nearly 300 extra houses there, and I think that should be into the plan. But when you take that plan into uh, the old plan, did show a new school at Dean Dallin and a bridge going across the river uh, to that uh, to that area. Unless there's a bridge across to EBO3, um, I don't think that area would become viable. Uh, as a development area, uh, because you can't have all traffic going through the village the way uh, EVO, EVO 1 or EVO 2 is uh, is allocated at the moment. Um, so I think that idea or proposal must be re looked at again. It's an old plan uh, and uh, that needs to be considered seriously. Um, <clears throat> and I think. I think that's about it. <laughs> right, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Would anyone like to come back on that? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, um, Edmonton uh, Railhawk, yes. Um, uh, reference to that's fine. The, the government's um, transport investment programs, uh, what's called STPR2, is being looked at at the moment. and. Uh, there's a lot more money going to be available in the next um, 10 years or so towards active travel schemes and rail based ones as well. So I think it's an opportune time to to have um, rail halt pro proposals there. So as I say, we're happy to um, en enhance that in the plan. Um, Highland Deep Haven. So one of the other um, employment areas that we didn't show you the map for is the Highland Deep Haven site, and uh, yeah, that, that's that's a one of the, uh, another identified site with its own text, text, text and map. Uh, I'm not sure offhand. Douglas is the expert on these development areas, and he can maybe uh, talk to whether the um, the rail line extension is already in the wording. If it isn't, we could add that in. Um, I'll turn to Douglas in a second. He, Douglas has been um, involved in the Freeport meetings as well, so he can give you an update on that one. Um, Evanston School, um, T and Dallin site. Um, the, Julianne was referring to the, the this is a uh, affordable housing agency led development, and yes, you're right. The, there was a um, uh, an issue about the capacity of the Sawdale Road, isn't it? Um, and whether all the development could could be accessed off that or not. Um, as far as I understand, the, the, there's already a minded to grant decision by the uh, North Planning Applications Committee, which um, doesn't include a bridge. Um, so uh, it, 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 it will get a, um, a planning permission very soon, as long as the Section 75 agreement signed. So um, as far as I understand it, that yeah, the North Planning Applications committee has already considered this issue and agreed that it should proceed uh, um I'm trying to remember the unit capacity it's over 100 houses i think but basically the there's a there's already a minded to grant decision for that one so it'd be be difficult for us i think to change the wording of the plan on that site um so that was what i had on on those questions i'll hand over to douglas though for the um uh the freeport and highland deep haven yeah, so the taking Highland Deephaven just now, um, there is we've still included that reference to the potential for a rail halt. It's it's pretty aspirational, but it, Highland Deephaven have joined the consortium of businesses um, who are you know seeking that freeport status. So if that was to go ahead, the the you know the demand for development in that area could increase and make that a viable scheme. So that's why we've included it. Um, in terms of the Freeport bid itself and the Oppor Opportunity Economy Perth project as a whole, you may be aware that that went to the Economy and Infrastructure Committee yesterday for essentially updating uh, members on the 
on the work of the opportunity economy for a group and um, the projects that, that basically the overall ambitions and project priority projects they're working towards and um, the role of council uh, officers in that so far and you know basically agreeing for our involvement in the in the group to essentially assess the merits or otherwise of the freeport bid so that's uh, that's where that stands you'll see in uh, in invergordon for example and it, and it really relates to uh, all the settlements in that area will be you know considering how that project develops over the next year leading into the proposed plan to see how we essentially plan for growth in that in in, in both these wards because um you know we're basing this we're basic we're largely basing the plan as it stands on current growth rates but if there is some major economic development in the area you know that's potentially transformational that will be taken into account in the levels of growth that we will be uh, looking to allocate so um Okay, thank you, Douglas. I have questions from Mike and then Maxine. Yes, uh, Tim, I want to come back to your answer, which I appreciate what you're saying there about EV02, I think it is. That's already been to the North Park and uh, the the um, entrance into that area will be through the, the village of Evington. Um, but um, the EV03 is a massive area in comparison to that. So what I'm talking about there is a bridge from the school area, roughly, on Drummond Road into that area. If that doesn't happen, because the amount of housing that can go into EV03 must be at least four or five times what's gone into EV02. So the bridge across the river becomes even more uh, 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 more important for the, the viability of EV03. So it's that particular bit I was really wanting to make sure that we can say if it's possible in the plan, a bridge is required when EV03 is developed. Oh, is that I'll maybe, possible? Okay, <laughs> sure. I'll maybe hand over to Julianne, who um, may, uh, well, I think will know more detail than me on the site. But I, as far as I understand it, the planning permission extends to uh, a lot of EV03. Am I right? Yeah. The, um, what is shown uh, against um, EV03 uh, and sorry, I don't have the map in front of me. Is it EV01 is the green site? I'll I'll share it now. Sorry, I've got it in front of me now. EV02 is shown as the green preferred and EV03 is the larger extent um, shown as amber. The permission that the application that went before North Pack was for the entirety of EV02 and EV03. Um, so that was for 140 units for the entirety of those two sites. Um, EV02 uh, was shown as phase one, uh, which was, I think, 40 houses, 40 units. Yeah, 40 units and 100 units on the remainder of what is shown as EV03. So that has all been to been through North Pack. Um, EV02 is the one that has a developer eager to get on site. The remainder of what is EV03 um, is probably longer term development. But it is 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 but there a has, bridge? Is there a bridge no. Um, condition? No. 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 Thank you. Certainly, the bridge was really spoken about at the at the time of the planning going forward, and uh, I think part of the wording was it was probably a preferable uh, access. Uh, I think that was the sort of wording that was given. So when development for EV03 comes forward. Uh, to the planning side of things, whoever the councillors are at that time, I'm sure they'd uh, they could raise that issue again regarding yeah. the bridge. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you, Mike. Maxine? Um, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, um, so I, I concur with my colleague about Edmonton as well. And, you know, it strikes me as we're talking about this, that a lot of this is going to be fluid, even though um, planners are saying, you know, we can alter it in the next year or so um, before it becomes kind of um, sort of permanent for five years. It's not really, is it? Because let's face it, if we get the Freeport bid and are successful in that, it's going to change everything in Easter Ross. And we're going to lead, lo need loads more areas that aren't currently zoned. And those two red areas that were in Gordon that I said I was content with, and, you know, I think I'd be coming back and going, you know, maybe we want to build the hydrogen hub there, but also maybe we want to build the hydrogen hub at Nick, you know. Um, so all of this is kind of up in the air, um, depending on what happens. Um, so I just want to finish off by saying, because one of my two of my colleagues have mentioned um, the Invergordon Consortium and the Freeport bid, um, I do hope this area committee in the future will, will fully back it um, because of its benefits. Clearly, it's going to come back to council, probably full council, it was agreed um, at ENI yesterday um, to, to discuss in further detail. And obviously, there's some, you know, the odd con about it, but I think on balance, it will be 75% pro and maybe 25% con. So I hope that you'll all think about supporting it. Um, because of its absolute economic benefit, huge economic benefit for Easter Ross. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Maxine. Is there any other further comments for the planners? No? Nope. Okay, thank you, Tim. Thank you, Julianne, and thank you, Douglas, for coming along and for your very comprehensive explanation of the proposals. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So members will move on to item number six on the agenda, which is the housing performance report contained on pages 135 to 139 of the report. You're invited to consider the information um, for the in the period the 1st of April 20 to the 30th of September 20. And we have Jim Holden, the housing manager for the North, who's here to um, address the report and answer any questions. I'll hand over to you, Jim. Thank you very much, Chair. Good morning, members. Um, thank you for your time today. Um, you've got in front of you the report on, on our performance. It obviously relates to the first couple of quarters of the year, 1st of April to 3rd of September. Um, so slightly historic as always, and maybe you'll have some questions that relate to where we currently are. But um, I think what it's, the report is showing generally um, is the initial impacts of um, COVID um, and the impact that's had on our on our tenants and also on our, our teams. Um, if I can say to you and use this opportunity just to um, say how lucky I have been as a manager of the team to have had such commitment from the housing team over the last few months, which have been particularly challenging for them in a variety of ways. Um, they've really risen to that challenge, um, gone above and beyond and it's been very um, gratifying to be the manager in that sort of situation. Um, nevertheless, we, we have faced some constraints on how we've been able to do our work. We've not been able to do the face-to-face -face bit, which is such an important part of housing work um, interaction with our tenants. It's had to be mainly by phone, um, by email, and one or two uh, new social media means. Um, net effect is that you're seeing some of the impact of that changing way of working on the figures that are in front of you. Um, and although I, I'm sure you've had a chance to have a look at it and you'll have some questions on it, um, I think there are some slightly concerning trends, particularly in relation to some of the performance on repairs um, and voids. Um, that's almost inevitable because of access problems to houses and the fact we've not been able to put tradesmen out in the field. Um, and in a, in a general sense, the trend on arrears, rent arrears, is, is not terrific. Um, I think I would say it's not quite as bad as we initially anticipated it would be, but um, equally we are in a um, position where the overall economic situation is, is very uncertain um, and potentially we haven't yet seen the major effects of the, those economic uh, problems. So um, thus far, it's not too worrying, um, but um, I'm, as I'm flagging up that potentially uh, future reports of this committee may not be quite so so good. But um, I've you have the report in front of you. Um, I suspect at this point um, 
you'd be happy enough uh, for me to uh, suggest if you've got any questions, please, please do so. Hope that's OK, Chair. Thank you, Jim. Yes, that's great. Um, I would just like to also congratulate all the staff on the hard work, the dedication um, that they have shown during the, the past few months. Um, in Highland, we, we particularly benefit from the really good working relationship that we have with our housing officers, tenant participation officers, um, our um, maintenance staff. They all have very good, close relationships with tenants. Um, more often than not, our tenants are aware, very much aware of, of who to speak to. They know the face even, um, which, which isn't the case in many other council areas. It's really just an anonymous person on the end of the phone that they deal with. Um, whereas in our area, certainly they, they know who to speak to. Um, they can chat to them face to face and it, and it deals with a lot of issues. And I think that's really key to, to the really good working relationship that housing service have with our tenants in the Highlands. Um, so I, I would just like to say that we're very much aware of the, the constraints and the difficulties that our housing staff are facing and that they're working under circumstances um, that are just totally different for them. They're having to do different ways of working, which they know are not ideal to. Um, and they do very much feel for our tenants and are aware of the difficulties that they're facing. Um, also, you pointed out the worrying trends, yes, and when you do read the report, it is deeply concerning, um, particularly with the, the maintenance issues that are going on and the length of time that it's taking to deal with that. Um, so it is worrying, but it's also understandable. Um, we can understand why this is happening, um, but we just want to make sure that we do everything as a council that we can to try and stop that trend, to try and stop it getting worse and to find different ways of working and to find ways around the situations um, that we're in. So thank you, Jim. And if you could make sure that all your staff are very much aware and um, that we are very much behind them and, and we do thank them for, for all the efforts that they have put in. Thank you, Chair. Much appreciated. Thank you. So Pauline and then Derek. Yeah, I was just about actually to say the same thing, Fiona, they have, they've went above and beyond the Call of Duty. Um, I know this is probably not the right place to put this, but I just want Jim to, to know that one of your staff, Key O'Dell, her name is, has been absolutely phenomenal for me. We've been working very, very closely together because we have a lot of issues with tenants falling out. Neighbours, you know, seem to be grassing on each other and the police involvement and there's been lots and lots of issues, and to be fair, Kia Dale, I, I, I want you to please go back and tell her that it's, all of the work that she's helped me with lately has been phenomenal, so it's a huge thank you. But as Fiona was saying, the repairs, yeah, that's the biggest issue we have. Uh, you know, I, I know how difficult it's been, and I know it's hard for you to get into people's houses and things, but it is now becoming one of the biggest issues in, in my ward certainly is the, the repairs or lack of and I know that's not your fault Jim but I just think you should know about them you know you should you should be aware thank you okay thank you Derek hey, thanks Fiona um yeah Jim uh, you know I'd, I'd just echo that uh, I uh, I think your staff have, have done a tremendous job um at a very difficult a set of circumstances they've had to deal with, and um, you know they're they're trying to get the job done in a in a, in a scenario which could never have really been imagined. Um, so you know, thank thanks for uh, the work the work you're doing. Um, I'll I'll restrict um, my comments just to the one item, which is the. Um, the the arrears uh, numbers and um, again I mean they have they have risen significantly but uh, you know given the given the difficulties that um, so many people are in um, I think uh, you've done you've done quite a good job because it, it looks as if in the second quarter um, the arrears had actually fallen from where they were at the first quarter. Um, so, you know, I, I'm 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 certain that's um, your staff uh, help, helping to direct our tenants to where support um, and assistance might be available. Um, and uh, you know, I I, I, um, I just want to uh, to thank you 
uh, again for uh, for doing that, and I hope that that um, is something that um, isn't going isn't going to get worse as time goes on. But uh, if it does, you know, we will will hopefully be understanding of why those circumstances have come about. And Mike. Yes, Jim, thank you so much for the report. And uh, I would uh, reiterate the remarks that uh, my colleagues have made with regard to the, the staff that you've got, very helpful, and uh, try to get to the bottom of any uh, or a solution to the various points. Your Appendix 1 uh, information, Jim, is for the whole of Russ and Cromarty, is it? Is that the situation there? Now, would it be possible to have an appendix that would relate to the our ward, our ward six and seven, uh, make it a wee bit clearer to us just exactly what's happening uh, on the local issue. Uh, also, we get that in the report, I know, but um, it, it's, laid, it's, it's very, very clear there in that appendix just exactly what's what's what. So uh, it was just that point. One other point, Jim, um, and I don't know if this is the place to raise it or not. Um, it's with regard to a number of folk who would like to have very small business opportunities in our housing estates. For example, a hairdresser or or uh, people like that who want to have a very small thing uh, going and uh, perhaps could we consider the conversion of garages that are not being used or whatever to, to accommodate folk who want to have a, a small business. Thank you. Jim, would you like to come back on those points? Certainly, uh, certainly, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, members. Um, and again, thank you for your um, good wishes and your support for for the team. Um, yes, there are, there are a number of sort of um, trends, as I hinted, that are are of concern. And, and um, you know, Councillor Loudon's quite properly picked up the the issue on arrears. Um, Donna and her team have worked consistently through the period um, trying to keep in touch with tenants. Um, as you say, we've got people who've never been in arrears before, who've lost their jobs and have not ventured into the wonderful world that is universal credit. Um, so, you know, our, our team that have worked closely with them to try and get them to fill in the right bits of paper and speak to the right people to get assistance, that's, that's been good. So we've tried to maintain the early intervention um, process, which is key to stopping rent arrears escalating. Um, we've been constrained in the sense that Scottish Government guidance has meant that we haven't been moving down the issuing of legal notices, but actually that's not been too much of a constraint and um, we've very recently agreed um, that we will start issuing notices again, but members will be aware that this is really the, the last stage. It's it's not really what we want to do, but it's a, it's a flag, to, a sort of fairly serious flag to tenants to let them know that we are uh, on their case and they, they do need to make proper arrangements. Um, so I think um, all we can do is maintain that contact with tenants, however we can manage that. Um, we do now have a protocol which enables face-to-face -face contact um, generally on the doorstep, but um, by other means if we need to. So that's an improvement on our contact potential as well. So Donna and her team will be, will be doing that. Um, I think um, Councillor Finneson, you asked you asked about uh, disaggregated appendix one. I'll, I'll ask our technical colleagues if they can achieve that. I'm not going to promise it because I think it may be a bit challenging, the same as it is for homeless figures. But we'll certainly take the point and see if we can do something. Um, the idea about um, small businesses and garages, I, I, th I suppose that plays into a conversation of what we've had previously at this committee and at others around the future of the council's garage estate. Um, optimizing it, if you like, sweating the asset. Um, we're not necessarily getting the, the full return from it that we might at the moment, um, in the sense that some of them aren't in good condition. Very few of them are used for actually putting cars in. So the kind of alternative that you're suggesting, Councillor Finneson, I think is part of a sort of options appraisal that would say, well, some of them might be suited for that. Others are distinctly not because of their condition or their location or whatever else. So if, if you're content um, to be reassured that we are looking at our um, overall housing garage estates to work out what we're going to do with them um, to make 
to get the best return and make the best contribution to local communities, which will obviously be north, depending on, on the areas. Um, and we'll come back to you on that as soon as we can. Um, I hope that's OK. Uh, it is fair to say, Councillor Finnesson, if it's helpful that um, people are not prohibited from running businesses from their home. Um, they obviously need to get our formal written permission for that. Um, and it kind of depends what they're wanting to do. Um, and we do have some people who run um, probably slightly less than suitable businesses from their home, and we sometimes have to take action to prevent that happening. But um, you know, we, we would like to think of ourselves as being supportive of that kind of enterprise at the very small scale that, that can obviously grow into some of the bigger picture stuff you've been talking about earlier in your committee. So um, uh, hopefully that's, that addresses the questions that you had. Thank you, Jim. That, that's very helpful. And I would just like to echo what um, Mike did say about supporting local businesses. And it is reassuring to know that you do encourage it um, and certainly that you're looking at the garage options. I've seen lots of um, head nodding going on. So I think the committee is very much behind um, you looking into to how we can make better use of our garages in the Easter Ross area and both wards. Certainly do that, Chair. Thank you. OK, thank you, Jim. Thank you for coming along. That's all the, the questions that we have. Thank you. Moving on now, members, to item number seven on the agenda, which is the Invergordon Inver Common Good Fund, pages 140 to 142. The committee is invited to scrutinise and note, one, the quarter two monitoring statement for the Invergordon Common Good Fund, and two, the current position in relation to the Invergordon Town Hall. Um, and Helen Ross, the ward manager, is here. If anyone has any questions, any comments they would like to make? No? OK, so you agreed the recommendations? Maxine? Sorry, I was thinking that Helen was going to speak on it, so I was waiting for her to speak on it, and I wasn't concentrating. Um, yeah, <clears throat> I just want to say that um, obviously we've we've been quite patient with the town hall issue as a scene, you know, what can be done with it. Um, <clears throat> I've got a meeting on Saturday um, with the museum people um, just to see if I have one last shot at trying to persuade them to consider, um, you know, taking on the town hall um, because it would make a great museum. However, um, I don't think um, I'm going to win through, but I'll give it a go. So I would like to see at the next committee, um, our area committee, maybe in December or in the new year, that we do make a final decision, um, well, a final kind of semi-final decision on what we propose that can happen with the town hall, um, because we really can't leave it just, you know, hanging hanging in midair like that because it needs a lot of work doing on it. So if I can just say, can we come back to a future committee and we can decide how we take it forward. Thank you. Absolutely, and I'm seeing your fellow ward members agreeing there, but it, it has been hanging around, as you say, um, and it does need um, a decision made um, as to the way forward, even if it's not the final decision, but we, I think we do need to see progress on that. Helen, do you have any comment you want to make on that? Well, really, just I'll obviously be bringing um, another report to the February committee, and I think in, I've already noted in this report that when we come to the February committee, you know, members may choose to to go external to see what other interest there is, and and obviously if there have been discussions with groups meantime, that that means that that would you know be an action that could be taken a bit more quickly. Um, and I've I've spoken briefly to the chair of the um, of the development trust, and you know they recognise that it is a difficult time, and obviously what they expected to do, um, it, it's just in a different environment, so they'll have to review it from their side as well, and and that will hopefully bring options for members. OK, thank you, Helen. So we are content to agree the recommendations, members. OK, moving on to number eight, the TAIN Common Good Fund, um, pages 143 to 146. And the committee is invited to scrutinise and note the quarter two monitoring statement for the Common Good Fund. Is there any comments or any questions on TAIN Common Good Fund? No? OK, so you agree the recommendations? Agreed. OK, thank you. Item number nine is the minutes of the meeting held on the 20th of August 2020. Any comments on those? 
No, thank you, members. So I can confirm that that's the end of the public section of the meeting and the recording will now stop. Thank you for everyone for attending.